Okay. So we're going to be talking about spirits and beer in this session. Um, where's my little? Oh, here's my clicker. Okay. So first here, quick brief on making spirits. Okay. So what do we start with? Yeah, we start with a raw ingredient. So basically we go out in the fields and maybe we harvest some corn or we harvest some wheat or some rye or some apples, whatever that might be depending on the spirit. We pull those out and then we obviously have to turn it into a juice or we have to crush it up a bit. Yeah. But the first thing that we start with is the raw material. Yeah. Then we take that raw material and we either mill it or press it. Okay, so milling might be grinding it up, pressing it might be taking a juice and turning it into a juice. Okay, the next thing that we have to do is something that's called mashing. Now what are we, do what are we doing when we're mashing? Okay, we're adding hot water, but what is that hot water doing? To take out all the aromas and the flavour of the raw ingredients. Well basically we're taking all the starches out. Okay, now after mashing, we add in some, uh, some yeast and we start fermenting. What are we doing there? Converting sugar into alcohol. Basically, yeah, we're, uh, we're adding the yeast in and it's turning, the, uh, turning into sort of a light alcohol, which is basically what we're creating is we're creating a wine or a beer, which the big difference between if we were taking a, uh, if we were do, may turning this into a beer, then we'll miss out the complete distillation process. Okay. For a beer, we don't need the distillation process. But as we're making a spirit, we need to distill it to turn it into a much higher alcohol. That's the next part of the process. Okay, so after that, and these can be in different orders, but normally after distillation, comes filtration. What's filtration? Clearing of the unwanted substances from the thing which we have produced. Shall we get someone else? Anyone else on filtration? Okay, we might use carbon, we might use charcoal, we might use any other number of things to filter the alcohol through. Basically what we're doing is we're, we're taking out conyers, which are, conyers are basically flavours in the, uh, the spirit. So what we're doing is we're making it more neutral and we're taking out any harsh flavours. We're also doing that through distillation. Now just going back to distillation, I've got basically two main forms of distillation. Can anyone tell me what the two types of stills are? Everyone knows that one. Okay, so we've got pot stills and we've got column stills. Okay. Basically, pot stills keep a bit more flavour, where column stills take out more flavour. Now, the more columns that are in the column still, or the bigger the size of the columns, depends on how many flavours get taken out. Some column stills might just be one column, they might take out a similar amount to a pot still. But generally there's multiple columns, in some cases masses and masses, now, obviously, the, the more times we also distill it, the more flavours we're taking out. The more times we filter, the more flavours we're taking out. Okay, next thing that we do, and this is again not the case for all spirits, things like white spirits, they might not be aged at all. But basically, we then have an ageing process with a lot of particularly dark spirits, your, things like your dark rums, things like your single malt whiskies where we put it in a barrel. Now, what are we doing when we stick it in the barrel? Again, we're adding wood flavours. Okay? We're slowly softening up the flavours and we're adding in wood flavours. We're also losing some alcohol from that distilled liquor every, every year, which is known as what? Angel share. Okay. And the final thing is we need to get it down to the designated proof. How do we do that? Add 
add water? We just add water. So say we distill it and it come, gets aged and it comes out of the barrel and it's 55%, but we want to sell it at 40%, we just add water to bring it to the designated proof. Yep. Well, we're not going to spend too much time on that, but that's the basis of distilling a spirit. Okay, now the next topic is rum. Yep. Where is rum from? Does come from Cuba? Yeah. Caribbean island. Yeah. Is it not from India? Do you not make rum? Yeah. Does Australia make rum? Where I'm from? Yes, we do. Okay. Rum's from all over the world. Okay. So it's not from one place, it's largely known around the Caribbean. The Caribbean is where the largest percentage of rum comes from, but it's made all over the world. Okay, now, the popularity of rum started with merchant navies and things like navies and the rush for the Caribbean islands. Now, what happened when, they, um, when the Spanish and the English and the French and the Portuguese started taking over these? different uh, islands in the Caribbean. They started planting sugar cane and it grew like crazy. It was originally sugar cane, the plant comes from a place called Papua New Guinea and the top of Australia, but it didn't grow anywhere as near as well there as when they took it to the Caribbean. Now, it did originally then make its way to, uh, to Europe via India, a guy, has anyone heard of Alexander the Great? Yes. Yep, look, he, uh, he basically took over the most of the world, but he came to India and got his butt kicked. But they stole some of your sugar cane and they planted it all around the Mediterranean basin. So then when they went to the, the New World, they took sugar cane a while along and sugar cane grew like crazy. Now, cheap way of, uh, of moving sugar cane was to turn it into a spirit. That spirit being rum. It was basically, if you put sugar in a barrel and it got a bit of water in it, it was spoiled by the time it got to, got to England or got to Spain or France. You put rum in a barrel and the longer it stays in that barrel, it gets better and better. Now, it also became part of a seaman's wages. So someone would be sailing the seven seas and basically part of his wages was rum. Now, what then happened is occasionally ships would run out of rum. You know what normally happened then? The captain got thrown overboard. Okay. But you couldn't go back to England, you couldn't go back to Spain because you'd thrown your captain overboard. So what did you become then? You become a pirate. And so piracy became synonymous with rum. In fact, to keep, their, uh, to keep all the pirates happy, you had to go and raid ships and steal rum. In lots of cases, you had to go and raid distilleries and steal rum. But that's where rum became famous with the oceans and sailing the seven seas. And we've all seen the pirate movies over the years and read the pirate stories. Now, it's also probably the most versatile spirit when it comes to making cocktails that there is. Anyone tell me why? Anyone? Want to have a guess? Come on, have a guess. Why do you think rum is the most versatile spirit when it comes to making cocktails? Uh, a good flavor? Yeah. Nothing to do with good flavor, there's so much variety in flavor. Okay? Now, rum has been largely. Actually, I'll, I've got out of order here, so I'll. Uh, okay. So basically, rum is made from sugar. Um, the two go hand in hand. 
I already explained a bit of the history earlier, but we can basically turn that rum. First thing is we can just grind it, turn it into a sugar cane juice. Okay. So we can distill that straight sugar cane juice. Otherwise, if we boil it a little bit longer, it becomes sugar cane honey or sugar cane syrup. If we boil it a lot longer than that, what does it become? It becomes molasses, turns black, totally caramelizes. Okay. Then there's another one that's called blackstrap molasses. When we boil it even longer and it becomes super thick and super gluggy. <laughs> so blackstrap molasses is not used too much, but it is still occasionally used in some rums around the world. Now, different things that affect the, the flavour of the rum is obviously, is it aged in barrels? Now, what type of yeast do they use? Now, what type of uh, still do they use? Okay. So there's lots of different things, whether it's made with sugarcane juice, whether it's made with molasses, whether it's made with sugarcane honey. Yeah. Again, yeah, there's lots of different stills. Has anyone seen on, on the shelves in the bar um, that we've got a Demerara rum? Yeah. This rum is actually made using a wooden pot still. How the thing doesn't catch fire, I've got no idea, but it's actually a, a wooden pot still. So lots and lots of different types of stills, different ways of making rum, which means there's great complexity, there's lots of different flavors. Now, there's also a huge language effect on rum. Now, basically as the, uh, as the different uh, colonies of the Caribbean. Basically you had the English, you had the French, you had the Spanish, and the Portuguese all going and sending their boats and ships and trying to claim islands. Yeah. So the Spanish islands, places like Cuba, places like Puerto Rico, uh, as well as many more, their rums tend to be light rums. Tend to be made from a sugar cane syrup, and the most famous one being things like Bacardi, things like Havana Club, but they tended to be quite light in flavour. Then you go to the English. Most of the English islands, they tended to be made with molasses. Now, so they had very dark rums. Or they had golden rums, but most of their rums were predominantly made with molasses. Then we go to places like Brazil, who are classically make a, a rum that's called cachaça. They're made with sugarcane juice. Okay. This was a Portuguese colony. Okay. Then you go to places like the French, French islands. They make something that's called rum agricole, which is basically made from sugarcane juice also and it tends to get quite a bit of aging. And then you've got some places like Guatemala and Nicaragua in Central America, where they age their rums quite a bit. And they're also made from sugar cane juice predominantly. The most famous one being Ronzagapa. And so these rums are very full flavored. Ronzagapa has aged up to 25 years, sometimes beyond. So, very rum, very complex rums. Again, some of the uh, parts of the Caribbean are also on the top of a top of the South American contact, continent, like Guyana, and they're also doing molasses and sugarcane syrup-based rums. So, it, depending on which country basically claimed your part of the world largely dependent on what type of rum you made, and still do today. Like, sometimes now that's changed over the years, but predominantly the <coughs> rums are still affected by which country. Now, another thing which affects rum is that there's no standards. Absolutely no standards. Every country makes up their own standards. Makes up their own aging criteria. Makes up, like, 
places like Cuba, for instance, they still use blanco, resposado, anel. Some places call their rums light gold, dark. So there's no standards across any of these islands. There's no standards on how long they're aged. There's no standards on what type of barrels. Some, some islands use brand new barrels. Other islands use ex-bourbon barrels or sherry barrels. No standards whatsoever across the rum world because there's so many different countries making rum to their own standards. Now, in Australia, we've got something called UP and OP, which is underproof or overproof. So, one of the things which makes rum versatile, but also makes rum very hard to carry, is that uh, there's no standards. Okay, now we're on the whiskey. Okay, now we're going to start with Scotch whiskey, but um, before we start with Scotch whiskey, which country was the first country to make whiskey popular? Scotland. Scotland. Incorrect. Any other guesses? Any other guesses? It's right next door, across a little bit of water. Irish. 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 Now, no one knows if Scotland or Ireland made whiskey first. But we do know that the Irish were the first ones to make it popular. And Irish whiskey was the most popular form of whiskey up until the Second World War. Okay. And the Scottish whiskey scene was basically largely started through several famines that happened across the years in, in Ireland. And so basically the whiskey makers had no barley or had no other grains, so they moved it across to uh, Scotland and started distilling their whisky there. And the heritage of most Scottish distillers um, has Irish blood in them back at some point in time. You might have a few upset Scottish people with that, but that's basically the... That's basically what happened. So the first people who made whiskey making popular were actually the Irish. But of course these days, scotch, particularly here in India, is the most popular product on the market. Now, it comes obviously in malt and it comes in blends, I'll go into that in a few minutes. Now, it has to be distilled two times in pot stills for all regions except the lowlands. In the lowlands, it's distilled three or two to three times in column stills. They have the choice of distilling it twice. They have the size choice of distilling it three times. Um, predominantly these days it's two times, but there is still some distilleries which are doing three times. Okay, now it's a, uh, it can have nothing but water added at the end. It can have nothing more than caramel added for, uh, not for flavoring, but for coloring. It has to be aged a minimum of three years. Most are aged significantly longer, but the minimum aging that you can have is three years. It has to be used in a used oak barrel. So basically they get barrels from places, largely from, uh, from old bourbon casks. Bourbon can only be used once. They're casks, but they also get sherry casks. They also get wine casks, they get port casks. Like there's a, a large array of places where casks can come from. It can have a minimum strength of 40%. Yeah. So Scotch whiskey has to be 40% or over. It cannot be 35%. It can be still distilled to only 94.8%. Yeah. So when they distill it, it can't be over 94.8% when it goes into the barrel. Okay. Now these are the regions of Scotland. This is slightly out of whack. Speyside's a lot bigger on the map. Yeah. So we've got these island regions first which go all around. Now, this biggest area, this is the highlands. Okay, this is Speyside. Down here you've got Isla, you've got Campbelltown, and over here you've got the, the lowlands. Now, officially the islands 
are not actually a region, but most people see them as a region. Officially, they're still part of the Highlands, but unofficially, everyone sees them as a region, as they have different, very different style of whiskey to that that's coming from the Highlands. Okay, now the Highlands is by far the largest area. Okay. So, as it's such a large area, and some are, some are in sort of mountain valleys, and other ones are close to the seaside, there's no real predominant style. However, they tend to be smoky, they tend to have quite a bit of heaver, which gives a little bit of a honey taste. They also tend to have quite a bit of honey. They tend to be quite fruity, and they tend to be quite flavorful. Okay, it's basically, Everywhere north of Glasgow is basically where the highlands start. So it's by far the largest, most rugged place which uh, Scotch whisky has come from, and currently it's got over 25 distilleries. Oh, my little thing is not changing. So I might have. The next region is Speyside. Now, Speyside has over 60 distilleries. It's by far the most large region for Scotch whisky, and particularly single malts. So, it's also got all the world's, a large percentage of the world's most popular distilleries. <coughs> it's where Glenfiddich is from. It's where Balvini is from. It's where Glenlivet is from. And the list goes on and on. Now, Speyside tends to be much lighter in character than other regions. It tends to be very easy drinking. It tends to be where people who are beginners to single malt whiskey enter. If you're entering and you're drinking an Islay, which is a big smoky malt, it's probably not going to suit your palate when you begin. So this is by far the most popular single malt region. Yeah. Now, tends to have very floral, very light, fruity characters. Um, a lot of characters like grassy hay notes. It uh, tends to have light, light spice. There tends to be a little bit of smoke, but not very much. These are very light in character, single malts. But as they age, then they, they do develop a lot, a lot more in character. So you'll get a lot of chocolates and things starting to come out as you get, as they age. But your 12 years and 15 years and the predominant ones that people are drinking, they're quite light in character, very easy to drink. So if someone's not used to drinking single malts, then you should probably push them towards a space side single malt. Okay, the lowlands, which currently only has four to five distilleries. Um, look, for me, whenever I taste the, the lowland distilleries, I always get a lot of grass. But there's not many, there's not many distilleries, and largely they're, uh, they're single malts uh, made for blending. The most popular one, the only one that we've got in the hotel is Glen Kitchy. Okay, Campbelltown. Now, at one point, Campbelltown was actually the largest single malt whiskey area in the world. Now, it's not too far away from Glasgow, and so it was easy to transport single malts back and forward between Campbelltown. Now, as roads got better across Scotland, and you had better access to Speyside malts, and you had better access to the Highland malts, it slowly became less popular. Then, at the same time, you had, you had a great reduction in the quality as it was the main region, so they were mass producing, so the quality dropped and other regions basically became more popular. On top of that, it, uh, some of its distilleries were bombed during the Second World War by the German submarines, 
So it, uh, it basically went from the most distilleries in Scotland to absolutely none, and currently it's making a, uh, a comeback. The uh, most popular one at the moment is Springbank, which I believe is coming into India soon. Now, it's not too far away from Isla, so again, you're going to get quite a bit of smoky character, not as smoky as Isla single malts, but quite smoky. It's basically a little leg that comes off, the, off Scotland. So you also get a lot of ocean flavors, a lot of seaweed, a lot of sea salt character. And there also you get quite a bit of dried fruits and things like that in their malts. Okay, now the next region is Isla. Anyone tell me a few famous Isla single malts? Brooklydic. Kalila. Kalila. Brooklydic. Yep. Talisker. Talisker. Yeah, Talisker. Talisker is not actually an Isla whiskey, it's from the islands. It's from the island of Skye. Lefroig. Lefroig is another one. Lagavulin, Ardbeg. Yeah. The big three are Ardbeg, Lagavulin, and Lefroig. These are the big three from Isla. They're very world famous, and can anyone tell me what they're world famous for? They're smoky uh, because of big the smoke, smoke, big peat, in your face, single malts. Now, there's also Butch Laddick on the same island. They basically make a, they make fairly unpeated malts. Mm. But all the other distilleries, Bunhabin, Kalila, they're all smoky single malts. Bowmore's another one, all smoky single malts. So this island, which is just a very small island, it's famous for its smoky single malts. Now, this is basically, as it's quite close to Ireland, this island, it's rumoured to be where single malt uh, distilling, basically where the, the first main place where it started happening in Scotland. Irish came over from famine, they started producing large amounts of single malt on Isla. So it's also rumoured to be where it all started. Okay, the islands. Now, as I said earlier, this is the moment is not an official region, but these go up all the way around Scotland. Now, currently there's 10 distilleries. The most famous ones, or the most famous is by far Talisker, as well as places like Jura, places like Scarpa, places like Highland Park. They're, they're the most famous island cinemas. Now, what would you expect would be a predominant flavour if you're on an island? Sea salt. Sea yes, sea. they're all largely affected red, by the sea. Red, so you're going to get, you're normally going to get quite a bit of uh, sea salt. You're also going to normally get some, some nice spicy notes. Mm -hmm. They also tend to be quite smoky. Mm -hmm. So that's island malts. Okay, now the types of Scottish whiskey. First you've got single malt whiskey. Anyone tell me what single malt whiskey is? Distilling, distilling. Okay, it has to be 100% malted barley. Okay, it can come from only one distillery. Okay, then the next one on the list is vatted pure or, or malt, or blended malt has lots of different names. Can anyone tell me what this is? This is a combination of single malts. So I want to make a, a single malt or a malt whiskey, but I don't want to make it from just one distillery. I'm going to blend them together from different distilleries. And that becomes a vatted malt. It's also called pure malt. It's also called all malt. It's also called blended malt, depending on who's making it, has lots of different names. Okay. Some popular ones are things like Green Label, Monkey Shoulder. Um, we've also got uh, Nika 17 in the bar. There's, there's a few of them around the place. Oops, sorry. Okay, then I've got Single Grain Whiskey. Anyone tell me what Single Grain Whiskey is? Okay, 
say say for blending i want to make a rye whiskey made with only one malt. then this and i'm making it only one distillery that will be a single grain whiskey i also might make a wheat whiskey or i might make a corn whiskey in fact i'm even allowed to use different i might make one with corn and with wheat for instance but it can only come from one distillery and it has to be made with a grain other than malted barley. If it's made with malted barley, it becomes a single malt. Okay, then we've got blended whiskies. Blends of malt or grain. Okay, Johnny Walker, for instance, Johnny Walker Black Label, or Shivers Regal, these are actually blended whiskies. They're whiskies which have some single malt and some single grain whiskey. All combined. Now they have master blenders and things who blend together to try and get consistency from year to year. Now normally the better the quality of the blend, the more single malt that's going to be in it. Yep. The lower the quality, normally the uh, the less single malt. Doesn't always mean the case, but normally in the better whiskies there's more single malt and there's less single grain. Obviously also the age of the whiskey that's going in greatly affects as well. Okay, Irish whiskey. Okay. As we mentioned, the, the Irish were the ones who first made whiskey famous and the Irish are responsible for taking single malt whiskey and blended whiskies and all the different styles of whiskies to the Americas. They're the ones who basically started the whiskey industry in America. They're the ones who started in Scotland, largely. So they're the ones that basically made whiskey popular around the world. So if you like whiskey, you owe a great, great uh, dedication to, uh, to the Irish. We have them to think, thank for the population of whiskey around the world. Now, they tend to not use peat. Some of their distilleries do use peat, but most of the time, Irish whiskies are unpeated and they're a lot more lighter in flavour than Scottish whiskies. Okay, now they also have single malt whisky, exactly the same as Scotland. But then they've got single pot still whisky. Now, this is an old style of whisky where they use malted barley as well as unmalted barley. Now, it takes an exceptionally long time to make. Now, when you add the Yeast in, it takes a long time to break down, it takes a longer time to distill. It's not so common anymore, but they also have a style which is single pot still whiskey. They also have grain whiskey and they also have blended whiskies. Okay, bourbon. Now, this is obviously a style of whiskey that uh, comes from the Americas. Now, it can be distilled to a maximum of 80%, it has to be made in new oak barrels. Yeah. Can't have old oak barrels, you can't reuse, reuse the barrels, always must be in a brand new charred oak barrel. <clears throat> now, it has to be made with a minimum one of 51% corn. In reality, most use more than 51% corn, but it can't have less than 51% corn. Okay. To be a Kentucky straight uh, bourbon, it has to be aged for a minimum of two years. But if it's under four years, it has to have how long it's aged on the bottle. Now, most bourbons are aged above four years or four years, but if it's aged longer than, yet less than that, it has to be listed on the bottle. Okay. Now, an old story is the bottled in bond. Now, for lots of uh, whiskey makers who want to show that their whiskey is slightly better than other whiskies, they actually send their barrels to government storerooms for a period of four years so they can have the bottled in bond Lego, which means that basically their, their whiskey is a little bit better quality and you know that it's definitely been aged for four years. So they'll actually send, this is particularly very common in vintage whiskies. 
of vintage bourbons. Now, you tell me, say whiskey. Can anyone tell me the difference? When they see whiskey, they prepare from charcoal. Yeah, they have charcoal filtration. Can also only be made, well, it's maple charcoal filtration. It can also only be made in Tennessee. Now, if they wanted to, they could call their whiskies bourbon, but they have very different character. They tend to be much sweeter with a maple flavor. And yes, they have to be made maple filtered. There is only currently two distilleries in Tennessee. Those are Jack Daniels and George Dickel. Okay, rye whiskey. In America, this basically has the same standards as basically bourbon or Tennessee whiskey. It has to have a fit minimum of 51% rye, and all the other standards are the same. Sorry? The mixer is the best example. It's the best we've got. Look, there's some fantastic ryes out there. Unfortunately, too many aren't getting into the Indian market. And Even with bourbon, there's some... also won the award for the best. <coughs> well, it's, I think it's won the best for the uh, best single barrel. Okay. Now, the funny place is when we get to Canada. Now, Canada is the most famous place for making rye whiskey in the world. However, Canadian rye whiskies do not have to contain any rye whiskey whatsoever. Um, basically, as long as it's in the, the style of a Canadian rye whiskey, they can call it a Canadian rye whiskey. Most do have, obviously, rye whiskey in them, but there's no standards, and they can basically do whatever they want. Okay, now, Japanese whiskies, which are becoming a very popular. They tend to be lighter in style. There are some like Yamazaki, which tend to be quite peaty, but most Japanese whiskies tend to be in a similar style to that from Speyside or the Lowlands, quite light and floral, easy drinking, single malts. And currently they're winning the most awards around the world. Now, the big new player, oh, one of the new players is obviously India. Um, particularly in the area of single malts. You're making some fantastic single malts, uh, such as Rampur, such as Paul John, and most famously Amrut. Um, however, most of your, um, most of what you guys will be drinking, things like your teachers and your Rob Stags and your signatures and your blenders prides, these actually tend to be uh, cane spirit, which is flavoured with whiskey. Much lower quality. That's one of the reasons why they're so cheap. So they're actually as much rum as what they are whiskey. Okay, the other big new player on the, um, on the world whiskey market is my, my place, Australia. Now, a few years ago, we uh, had Sullivan Cove win best uh, single malt in the world, best whiskey in the world. Um, and in Tasmania, there's been 31 distilleries pop up over the last 15, 20 years. And I think there's 91 across Australia. And at the moment, I think we're uh, pretty much coming second to Japan as far as awards go. So, new players Australia. So, keep an eye out for those Australian whiskies. They're bloody good. Okay, Brandy. Okay. Brandy basically started its life because the French started taxing um, basically on the volume of alcohol you carried. So wine was sort of 8 to 12 percent and sort of took up a lot of barrels. So what they started to do in Armagnac was they started to actually boil down this, this brandy so that basically rather than having to carry, say, five barrels, you carry one barrel, you got taxed exactly the same, and then when you got it to where you wanted to sell it, you just watered it down and turned it back into wine. So this is how brandy actually began its life. Now, it's, uh, it's basically mainly made from grapes, but can also be made from pretty much any other fruit. Okay, so mainly aged in 
wooden barrels to um, oak barrels to get complexity. Okay, now Armagnac. Now, Armagnac began its life back in the 15th century. It's about two centuries older than cognac. Now, with Armagnac, they're much more complex than cognacs. They're only distilled one time. And this is for something that's called a Verdier still, which is a still which is only used in Armagnac. It's sort of a combination between a column still and a pot still. But they tend to be aged for significantly longer periods than, than cognac. And there's no big Armagnac houses. They're all small operations. So in cognac where you've got the Hennessy and you've got Martel and you've got Remy Martin, tends to be much smaller operations in Armagnac. But incredibly complex and hope we get some on the Indian market, but I don't, we haven't had any for quite a while. Yeah, now it can be made from many different grape varieties. Um, so where cognac's just made with Uma Blanc, then basically there's about 10 varieties that uh, can be used to make Armagnac. Okay, now different, um, different standards. You have vintage, where the Armagnac has to be from a single year. Okay, and both Cognac and Armagnac have exactly the same standards. So VS, minimum two years spent in wood. Okay, VSOP, at least four years in wood. XO, at least six years in wood. And Paul's de Age must be at least 10 years in wood. Okay. Traditionally, they're a lot older. Okay. These are minimum aging. So you might, you might, in an XO, you might have some of that cognac might be 20 years old. Okay, cognac. Now, this is the area of France. Armagnac's a bit lower down. Okay. Now, again, incredibly complex. Tends to have Tesby is famous for its aroma as well as its taste. And it's distilled two times. And there's only one grape variety. Can anyone tell me what that grape variety is? Uniblanc. Just one grape variety. So all cognacs are just one, one grape variety. Okay, now there's two types of barrels which are used to age cognac in. The most famous one is limousine oak. Now, this adds lots and lots of flavor, very quickly. However, there's troncus oak, which is a much thicker grain, adds a lot less tannins, and this is what they tend to use for their really old cognacs. Because it imparts flavor much slower and doesn't add as much tannins in. It's also a very expensive type of oak. So they just use it for their, tend to use it for their old, older stuff. Now, just on the grape variety, it's uh, very high in acidity and low in alcohol. So this is where it's perfect for distilling, gives a lot of complexity of flavor when it's distilled and when it's fermented. Okay. These criteria are exactly the same as Armagnac, so I won't go over them again. Okay, grappa. Now, grappa basically is the wastage from Italian wines. Basically what they, uh, what they do is they keep the skin and they keep the seeds. So you've got a picture here. With the, basically what's left over is what's called pomace. They then, dis they then ferment that and distill that and they turn into a spirit called grappa. It tends to be it can be aged, but uh, it tends to be normally a, a lighter spirit. It's um, traditionally the lighter unaged varieties are drunk before dinner. The older ones are drunk after dinner. And it's the most popular spirit in Italy. Okay, eau de vies. Now, these are basically your fruit brandies. So, Basically, they can be made from just about anything. So I'll get into the styles. First, we've got, sorry, schnapps. 
Now, you've got the most famous one there, which is probably Jägermeister. Now, this is actually a herbal schnapp from Austria. Now, basically, what they'll do is exactly the same process, is they'll basically go and they'll um, distill apple juice, or it might be peach or plum, or whatever they feel with. They'll turn it into a spirit, and then it's called a schnapp. Now, schnapps are also sometimes used to describe um, something that's slightly lighter than a liqueur and sugar. So you've got things like Archer's Peach Schnapps, which we've got in the bar. It's actually just a, a liqueur that's lighter in sugar than traditional peach liqueurs. Now, made in many different styles. In fact, this one, Teshna here, I actually used to work for them. So. Now, Calvados and cider brandy. Calvados can only come from one part of Normandy. And it's made from apples and pears, predominantly apples. And these apples are basically distilled into an apple brandy, which uh, tends to be uh, after di uh, before dinner or after dinner drink, mainly after dinner. And it's basically a brandy that's made from apples. Uh, Priore Williams, this is a eau de vie which is made with Priore Williams plum, oh, sorry, pears. Okay, normally one of the great things with these, with the better quality ones, they'll actually put the bottle on the end of the tree and the pear will actually grow up inside the bottle with the better quality ones. Then we've got Kirsch, which this is a cherry brand. Go the agave spirits, tequila. Now, tequila comes from this part of Mexico and this part over here. But this main area in here, Jalisco, is the main area where most comes, most of the tequila comes from. Now, you might have also seen Corellio in the bar. That comes from another state called Jalisco, or called Guanajuato, I should say. But the main region is Jalisco. Now, they're made from a plant that's called agave, which is actually part of the lily, lily family. It's not actually a cactus, even though it looks like a cactus. Now, basically, this plant has a huge big seed underneath the ground. Now, basically, this has to be removed by, by hand. There's, it uh, can't be pulled out with machinery. So it's a very labour-intensive spirit to make, and if the Mexican economy ever went up, then it would become over-the-top expensive. But because Mexico doesn't have such a strong economy, you can pay these guys to do it for next to nothing, and that's why tequila remains. Now, tequila also is currently the, uh, the second most popular spirit in the US, the third most popular being mezcal, with whiskey, American whiskey being the, the most popular variety of spirit. And look, they, um, these, another thing with these peanuts is they, they have to stay in the ground for over a decade. So they're in the ground a long time. It takes a long time for the plant to grow. Now can anyone tell me the only, the only type of agave that we use in tequila? Blue Weber agave. Okay, so can only be made with Blue Weber agave. Okay, now again, large harvesting time. Okay. Basically, then what we do is we have to cook these agaves, then we shred them up, then we go into our distillation of the mashing process. So there's another couple of parts of process. One is you have to obviously pull it out of the ground, then you have to basically rip it all apart, then you have to oven cook it to bring all the juices out, which most of the juices are in the heart of the peanut, and then you, um, and then you go into your mashing process. Now, this is a spoon with peanuts being cooked, and this is a picture of the mashing here. Okay, now, two main different styles. Now, we have mixed-o, and we have puro. Now, puro tequilas, 
have to be made from 100% blue wear agave. Now in the hotel, we've got Calais 23, we've got your Patrons, we've got your Corellios. These are all premium puree tequilas. Then we have stuff like Camino, Jose Cuervo, and um, Sosa. Basically, these only have to be 51% Blue Weber Agave, and then they add cheap cane spirits in. Now, as it takes a lot of work pulling these peanuts and things out of the ground, look, they're massively cheaper. But they're not so good to drink, <coughs> and basically they're, they're rubbish. People predominantly drink these as shots. Well, they're puree tequilas. They have the complexity of drinking a cognac. So, lots of complexity in the premium tequilas. Okay, so different types. You've got Blanco tequila, which, um, which is basically aimed to age for zero to two months. <coughs> you got Resposado, which is aged from two months, or two months to 12 months. Okay, 12 months to three years. You've got Añejo. Extra Añejo is over three years. Okay, now one thing you're gonna take into account is that you might sort of compare this to Scotch whiskey, and you might say three, yums, three years is not much, but you've got a lot more temperature in Mexico compared to Scotland. So the effect of the wood is coming in much quicker than what it is with a Scotch whiskey. So one, you're getting a lot more alcohol evaporate quicker, but also the wood, that alcohol is getting into the wood and that wood flavor is getting into the alcohol a lot quicker in an area that has high temperature. So in places with high temperature, you get much more wood complexity a lot quicker than what you would in place like Scotland. Okay, Mezcal. Now look, I'm just gonna describe this off our, our pictures. Now, firstly, this is how they actually, you saw an oven on the other tequila. This is how they cook the peanuts. Now, Mezcal is, doesn't use blue weather agave. They can use any one of about 30 different types of agave. But this is how they actually cook those agaves. Basically, they dig a big hole in the ground. They put in coals, then they put in some dirt. Then they put in all the uh, agave peanuts. They put dirt over the top, more coals on top. And they cook it for several days, basically in the ground. So there's basically no spirit that's as artisanal as what mezcal is. And we're starting to get mezcals are now going to be coming on the market. Okay. This is your traditional mezcal still. You've seen pictures of big metal stills in big distilleries. Basically, this is a clay pot here. Basically, underneath here, you, uh, you put your coals and you heat things up. You put your, basically, mash in here, and you keep water coming in the top, so basically, as it goes up, it goes back down again. And out this little bamboo shoot, basically, the mezcal comes out into a bottle. Now, depending on the mezcal distillery, they do this two to three times before they go to the aging process. So, very unique process of making to, of making mezcal. Now, the predominant flavour of mezcals is they tend to be smoky, very complex and smoky. Now, again, it's uh, called Joven rather than Blanco. Uh, Resposado is two months to one year, Añejo is one month to three, and over three years, or up to three years, over three years I should say, is extra Añejo. Now, they also do mixed o tequilas, but mixed, uh, the mixed o mezcals, but they have to have a minimum 81% mezcal versus cane spirits. So mixed o mezcals are of much better quality than mixed o tequilas. Okay, Jim, and your neighbor. Okay, now this is a famous picture here, which, um, which basically is from a period called the gin craze, back in our 1700s, when basically gin drinking was so out of control that um, you had people getting sick and the government decided to ban gin and basically gin got, gin got banned 
um, there was huge big riots. <coughs> My apologies. Okay, and this picture here is Gin Lane, and this picture here where everyone's having a nice uh, pic from last time, that's actually Beer Lane, or Beer Street, I should say. Okay, Gin is basically, in short, it's a vodka, which is must be flavoured with juniper and other botanicals. So your base spirit is basically a vodka. Okay, now London Dry Gin, it has to be made from a minimum of 75% corn, 25% barley and other grains. Mainly it's barley, but sometimes they might use wheat or rye. <coughs> but the base spirit has to be 75% corn. It must be juniper dominated. Okay, you can't add anything but water at, after it's been distilled. So after you distill the whiskey, you can only add water to bring it down. You can't add any extra flavours in. And most of the time it contains juniper, uh, angelic root, licorice root, and coriander seeds. These are the most common botanicals. There's lots more. But... Okay, bathtub gin. This is basically an infusion style of gin, which became popular during the, during the Prohibition period um, when alcohol was outlawed in the US. So basically, you'd distill a cheap spirit, you'd throw juniper berries up and botanicals in the bathtub, and basically to hide the fact that it was a terrible quality spirit being made. Old Tom Gins. Now, Old Tom Gins is the spirit which most of the world's most famous cocktails, including the Martini and the Aviation, were made from. This, ha this is lightly sweetened gin. Okay. So it's a gin that's a little bit sweet. It was the most popular gin up until around about the 1920s, 1930s, when London Dry Gin became the most popular. Okay, New Wave Gin. Now this is gins like Monkey 47 and Hendrix. Basically any gin that doesn't fit in another category, any other category, basically this becomes a New Wave Gin. There's a couple of other styles like Navy Strength, which are a lot less common, so I won't go into them. Okay. But Yennefer, this is the original style of gin, which, uh, which comes from the Netherlands and also from Belgium, or what's also known as Holland, which is an area that was known as the Lowlands when it was originally created. Now, it's actually a mix of gin and something called malt wine. Now, malt wine is basically a... Uh, is basically malted barley, which is distilled into a, a light alcohol neutral spirit. Yeah. Now, normally it's 15% of malt wine is added into a Yeneva. The rest is basically a gin, like any other gin, which is normally juniper dominated with other botanicals depending on what the maker goes for. So, but what it, what it has is it's got a much more malty flavor, a lot more grainy flavor to it, because obviously you've got all the malted barley from the malt wine in there. Okay. Now the different types, we've got Age of Geneva, which is also known as Old, and can't go above 30%, 5% alcohol, and must contain 15%. It's normally aged. Now it doesn't have to be, but it's normally aged. And it can't contain more than 100 grams of sugar. Okay. Now, Young Geneva, which is, tends to be the, um, the new style of trendy sort of Geneva, which they've sort of aimed more at cocktail mixology. Um, we're not getting many Genevas, in the, we're not getting any Genevas in India, but they have become more popular around the world. These tend to be very similar in style.